another settlement has sent word. My friend! Or are you just naturally berserk? This is a detailed look at the companions and their stories in the Fallout franchise. This video and part 2 coming very soon are a testament to my love of Fallout. I hope you guys enjoy, it's been a lot of hard work and I still have a lot to go. Please consider liking and subscribing for more Fallout on the way. Enjoy the video. <laughs> That's right, your favorite furry companion exists in the very first game. Dogmeat is extremely important to the Fallout franchise as he is the only companion that can be found throughout most of the mainline Fallout games. Now whether you believe he's the same Dogmeat or not is up for debate. Fans just find it odd that there are multiple dogs in different times and different places around the wasteland that are all named Dogmeat. Maybe because it's an ongoing joke that has circled around the wasteland and wastelanders. Maybe it's just mere coincidence. Or maybe it's because he's an eldritch being. No, I'm not joking. <laughs> Some people really believe that, and in my Fallout Iceberg video, I go over the theory a little more. But we're just going to follow the safest route and assume all these lovable canines are separate beings that exist in different times and places. Dogmeat 1, as I like to call him, is a loyal and formidable canine companion that can be found in Junktown where he's causing a bit of trouble for an old man named Phil by blocking his doorway. However, the Vault Dweller, the player character, can recruit Dogmeat by distracting him with an iguana on a stick or by wearing a leather jacket. This is similar to Dogmeat's previous owner. Once recruited, Dogmeat becomes a reliable companion in combat, capable of dealing significant damage with his three attacks per turn. The backstory of Dogmeat is pretty tragic, as his previous owner was killed by thugs hired by Gizmo, a notorious character in Junktown. Despite this, Dogmeat forms a strong bond with the Vault Dweller and becomes an essential ally on their journey. Dogmeat is named for the titular dog in the 1975 movie A Boy and His Dog, which is based on the novel by the famed sci-fi author Harlan Ellison. Its plot concerns an apparently psychic dog, conversing with the human Vic as they both scour the wasteland for food and women. The dog's name was Blood, but Vic also called him Dog Meat. He also invokes the dog from Mad Max the Road Warrior, where you can see that Max wears a leather jacket and carries a sawed off shotgun. These all sound incredibly similar to Dog Meat's previous owner. So let's talk about the Fallout Bible and what it has to do with Dog Meat and the rest of the companions on this list and Fallout 2. The Fallout Bible is a collection of documents containing background material for the first Fallout games. They were compiled, written, and released by Fallout 2 designer Chris Avalon in 2002. Chris himself said the things in the Bible weren't canon, but then Bethesda decided that some of it was. So it's really hard to say what is or isn't canon because they like to pick and choose. The reason I bring this up is because the Bible has some interesting things to say about what happened to Dogmeat. Unfortunately, it does let us know that Dogmeat died in 2162, but that's really weird because, spoiler alert, he may or may not show up in Fallout 2, which takes place long after Fallout 1. Also a quick last note on this character, he was actually named Dog Shit in the beginnings of the game's creation. So that's a little fun fact. happened a few decades back. Basically, a bunch of countries got kind of antsy, and everything went boom. 
Ian is a short, stocky caravan guard who adopted Shady Sands as his new home. He was working for the Crimson Caravan Company during a routine caravan route to the small settlement. However, routine does not mean safe. He was shot by raiders, and then he stayed in Shady Sands to recuperate. His experience and skills helped him contribute, as very few of the townsfolk ever left its safe walls. He does occasionally make a run to Junktown and the Hub to do trading. He's strong, confident, and independent, a perfect wastelander. Ian can be recruited as a companion for 100 caps or for free if the player character has an intelligence of 6 or higher. As a companion, he's skilled with small guns and can use pistols, large handguns, knives, unarmed weapons. However, players should be cautious when giving him a 10mm SMG, as his AI might cause friendly fire incidents due to the bursting firing mode of the gun, unleashing all hell around him and you standing in the way of that hell. But despite this, Ian is a valuable companion in combat, significantly increasing the player's ability to handle threats in the wasteland. Ian has unique dialogue for various locations in the wasteland, especially about places like Junktown and the Hub. He also becomes hostile if the people in Shady Sands are attacked without his company, showing his loyalty to that settlement. So what happens to Ian after the events of Fallout? Now, the only thing we have is from the Bible, and remember what I said about that, just take it with a grain of salt. While traveling with the Vault Dweller, they reach an Acropolis and engage in a battle with the super mutants at the Watershed. During the fight, Ian is killed when a super mutant unleashes a flamer, burning him to death. The smell of Ian's burning body haunts the Vault Dweller for years to come, showcasing the emotional impact of his loss. Pretty tragic fate for such a beloved companion. But oh well, at least he won't shoot you in the back anymore. I've seen a rat with three eyes once. That's about all I know about mutants. Katya or Katya? I'm not sure. Google says that the Russian way to pronounce it is Katya, so that's what we're going to stick with. Anyway, Katya is interesting because she's a thief and a scavenger living in the boneyard. She was born and raised in Aditum, a slave labor camp by the way, and she spent a lot of her life as a scab trawling the derelict Los Angeles for anything of use. Because her job was so dangerous and the fact that she hated being caged in like an animal, she decided to leave and make her way to the boneyard. There, she became a successful thief and stayed fairly safe as she could. Most of the area she prowled was filled with just humans and fairly few mutants. Katja can be found residing with the followers of the apocalypse in the boneyard library. Unlike Ian, no bottle caps need to be paid and no correct dialogue options need to be chosen. She'll just join the Vault Dweller's party if simply asked nicely to do so. Unless the Vault Dweller killed anyone in Shady Sands, then she'll refuse to join. Katja knows everything about the Boneyard. She's lived here and experienced the worst and even the more worse. She hates the warring factions, the clans, the criminals, the cults, and even the greedy merchants residing in the hub. As far as she's concerned, 9 out of 10 people in the Boneyards fall into three categories, rapists, murderers, and or thieves. She can tell the thieves apart from the others on account of being one and developed a keen survival instinct to keep the other two categories at bay. She has an array of skills like knife fighting, submachine guns, and throwing sharp objects. Katja is like most in the wasteland. She doesn't trust people and she really doesn't believe that humanity can bounce back from its past transgressions. She will give her perspective on several of the factions within Fallout 1. She believes her hometown is paranoid, the boneyard is torn by violence and greed, the cathedral is obsessed with a dark god and our cultists, and the only supposed positive force being the followers of the apocalypse are just not good enough at survival in her opinion. And all the friends and family she ever had are swallowed by the wasteland and even one of her most recent friends died of an overdose from Psycho. We don't really have knowledge of what happens to Katya. We do have to just assume she's long gone, considering the current Fallout present is taking place about 120 years later, give or take. But it sounds like she was really conflicted companion at heart, and that her placing faith in anyone was extremely difficult, except for the Vault Dweller. One last thing, she isn't a dog person. She will note that she hates dogs if dog meat is in the party. Do with that info as you will. The war was a testament to human greed and insanity let's hope that we have learned enough to never repeat such folly the last companion in fallout 1 i know these companions aren't as flashy as their future counterparts but i still believe that their lore and backgrounds are incredibly interesting laying the foundations for the future companions and the people Tycho is a desert ranger yeah like the rangers you're thinking of to recruit Tycho, you have to head to junk town scum pit He's then found at a bar where you can mention a quest that he would like to join in on, which he will if you haven't completed it yet. And then you can have a drink with him. 
But if you already completed the quest, which is killing a man named Killian, Tycho won't join you. Tycho wears the classic leather armor with a trench coat and a gas mask. He was born in a survivalist community in what was once Nevada. Tycho is the grandson of a Texas Ranger and heir to at least two generations of training, knowledge, and weapons. His family rode out of the war in the safety of this community in the Nevada Badlands, learning everything about survival in his youth from identifying safe water sources to a laundry list of little things to look out for, and growing up hearing stories about the wasteland, such as his father's experience with a fat freak in Las Vegas. Eventually, he became a full member of the Desert Rangers, using his survival and combat skills to go out in the world and make life just a a little easier for mankind, like Texas Rangers of old. Tycho developed a taste for travels, first close to home, then steadily expanding his horizons as he gained experience. Eventually, he reached the Gulf of Mexico in former Texas, becoming a long-range explorer for the Rangers. By the time the Vault Dweller runs into him, he's taken a break from exploring in order to take it easy at Junktown for a while. With so much knowledge, Tycho knows all about the sort of myths and forbidden knowledge in the wasteland. He knows about the vaults, pre-war military bases, the force fields, and even the nuclear strikes. He also has a ton of information about wasteland wildlife and the monsters roaming the land. Tycho has been in countless battles and has scraped by in many of them. He tells you that he's missing teeth, parts of his ears, rib fractures, and all kinds of unimaginable injuries. Because he's so weathered and scarred, he's gained a sort of grim resolve and outlook on life, explaining that his enemy should aim for the head. Wait a second. Tycho has a good moral compass, and he's fairly firm in his beliefs. He believes that Killian should be in charge of Junktown and believes that he can bring order to the lawless pit. He'd do it himself, but he's getting tired of either making things worse or not letting the right things just happen. Self-reliance is his game, and he hopes that the Great War was the pinnacle of human greed and selfishness believing in the future of humanity. Tycho is later mentioned in Fallout 2, but that's the last we hear of his tale. A badass that roamed the waste, taking down raiders and mutants, and saving people from themselves. I hope he went out just like he imagined. Fallout 2 is a little tricky when it comes to the companions. The game has a plethora of NPCs of men, women, dogs, and monsters ready to sign up for the line of duty in the Chosen One's army. Some of them though basically have no background or interesting tidbits to dive into, so we'll bang some of those out pretty quick. John is an old man. Surrounded by the thick walls of Vault City, the place he calls home now, and where he decided to settle down when he learned that his heart was failing. John has been through the absolute ringer, a veteran of the worst places the Wasteland has to offer, and he has the scars to prove it. A knifing, multiple gunshot wounds that occurred in 2195, 2199, and 2201. Don't forget, he also has a metal plate in his skull and a fake eye. The fact that this guy is still alive is incredible. Not many get to see old age in the wasteland. John Cassidy is a pleasant but prejudiced man to talk to, provided the person doing the talking does not get on his bad side or happen to be in the wrong race, as he despises ghouls for existing and generally dislikes people he perceives as despicable. He can be direct at times, and he has further issues with tribal prejudice, but overall, he's a great companion. Like I said earlier, John learned that his heart was failing and he requires regular heart booster shots to keep going. That's why he's stuck in Vault City. He runs the bar, the Spittoon, in the courtyard, paying a hefty fee for a license to sell real alcohol on the premise. He manages to get by well enough, able to pay for his rent, license fee, and afford booster shots from Doc Andrew. His business did take a hit recently as Sergeant Stark led a raid on his bar, confiscating all his alcohol and detaining several customers. Already disgusted with the city, it is practically the final straw for him. He declares that he's skilled with shotguns and rifles mostly, as well as pistols. He can also use brass knuckles and spears. He claims that he used to hunt with a spear, but expresses shame about making him seem like a tribal. At this point, the Chosen One can state that they are a tribal, after which Cassidy will sincerely apologize and claim that spears are fine weapons used by many of his tribal friends. A few fun notes on Cassidy. One, if the Chosen One decided to give him any sort of chems or drugs, John will instantly die of a heart attack. 
so be nice. He's also one of the few companions that doesn't have a talking head, which basically means he doesn't have that zoomed in face during conversation. And you can't recruit him if you have low karma or intelligence, so don't be dumb and or a criminal, or both. He also references Final Fantasy in one of his dialogue lines by saying, I wish I had a limit break. So what happens to John after the events of Fallout 2? Well, Cassidy joined the Chosen One in his journey, leaving Vault City behind. The two eventually parted ways, with Cassidy settling down again with a tribal woman despite his reservations about the tribals. At his ripe old age, John became a father of a daughter who took after their father. A few years later, he left the two and journeyed east of California, never heard from again. He went on to search for Texas, breaking south through NCR and past Dayglow. One last thing about John, his daughter that I spoke of? is actually on this list, and if you're astute, you probably already sussed her out. Of course, it's Fallout New Vegas' very own Rose of Sharon Cassidy. We'll get to her a little later, and maybe find out a little more about John. Davin is an interesting one. A handsome young man in his 20s, Grisham, the owner of the slaughterhouse in Modoc's only son, looks very much like his father. He's currently preparing himself to inherit the business once his father kicks off in his own terms. Until then, he's the slaughterhouse's supervisor, well known to all the others. He gets on well with his father, but is aware that Grisham likes to hit two birds with one stone and advises anyone getting into the business with him to look out for any unforeseen elements of his deals. He is no layabout either. Grisham taught him how to skin Brahmin and had him prepare leather, making him skilled with a knife, and on occasion he even put down one with a crowbar for his dad. He doesn't like firearms. The one time his dad tried to teach him to shoot straight, he got scared and almost shot his dad down. Davin is rumored around town to engage in, uh, relations with the Brahmin. Davin admits to going to the barn at night, but only to make sure it's locked up. What with all the wild animals coming around. Now, the real interesting thing about Davin, besides the Brahmin Eiffel Tower stuff, is that Davin can also engage the Chosen One in relations as well, regardless of gender. Though the line he says when you're a male is pretty funny. He'll offer the Chosen One to be his caboose. Take that as you will. Now, if this does occur, an event will take place. Grisham will enter the room and realize what's going on. Unless the player decides to play the situation off as a medical examination, which Grisham appears to be ready to believe without a speech check, the only other option is a shotgun wedding. If you try to run away, the whole town of Modoc will try to murder you. Now, if this isn't part of your plans, you can choose to divorce Davin in three different ways. One, he accidentally and unfortunately can die. Two, he can be sold into slavery. Who would do that though? And lastly, you can have Father Tully in New Reno just peacefully divorce you. Other than that, that's all she wrote about Davin. We have no information on what happened to him. Only the Chosen One knows. But I would take a guess and say you won't find him very far from the Brahmin. Hey girl, what's up? No. He's back. Dogmeat returns as a companion in Fallout 2. He can be found in the Cafe of Broken Dreams, an Easter egg special encounter in which the player finds a diner in the desert where wastelanders congregate from across time and space. Dogmeat will travel with the Chosen One if they interact with him while wearing their ancestral Vault 13 jumpsuit. Also, if you recall, Dogmeat should be dead at this point, according to the Bible. Also, the people in the cafe where you find him in Fallout 2 reference Fallout 1 directly, breaking the fourth wall. So it's really hard to say if Dogmeat is even canon in this game or not. I mean, he's here. He can travel with you through the entire game, but maybe it's just a dream. Who knows? I guess it's up to you guys to decide. Goris is not your ordinary Deathclaw. In Fallout 2, this intelligent and inquisitive dark gray Deathclaw resides in Fallout 13, disguised in a long-sleeved hooded robe to blend in with humans. Why the disguise? Well, as Goris puts it, humans have a habit of shooting Deathclaws on sight. Despite his imposing appearance, Goris is a scholar at heart, eager to learn about the world beyond the vault and understand human culture. When the player character encounters Goris, he expresses a desire to venture out into the wasteland again for his research. However, he doesn't like to travel alone and offers to join the player as a companion. He believes that by working with humans, Deathclaws can be seen as friends rather than enemies. One of Goris' unique traits is his albinism. 
which gives him his dark gray hide and his red eyes, which does differentiate him from all the other death claws. His sensitive hide requires him to wear his robe at all times, only removing it during combat. Gorus also possesses a telepathic sense, connecting him to his brothers, which becomes evident when the Enclave attacks Vault 13. If he accompanies the player, he feels his brothers are in danger and rushes back to help them. In terms of gameplay, Gorus is a permanent companion with exceptional strength and unarmed combat skills. However, his reliance on claws limits his weapon choices. Despite this, his combat prowess and intellect make him a valuable ally. So what happens to Gorus? Well, according to the main quest of Fallout Shelter Online, a wise Deathclaw was found to be living in the glowing sea on the opposite coast decades later. A new mother, Cura, travels to the Commonwealth in disguise with her egg in tow. She mentions being inspired by a distant relative that used to hide his identity so that he could travel with humans. I don't know if Fallout Shelter is even canon. I didn't even know it existed before this video. So do with that info as you will. So if you're looking for a companion with brains, brawn, and a killer sense of style, literally, Gorus might just be the Deathclaw for you. And he's the only Deathclaw companion in all the canonical games. Meet K9. Unlike your average cyber dog, K9 is not just a metal mutt. He's fully sentient, and he can chat you up in multiple languages. But don't let his fancy vocabulary fool you, he's got a bone to pick with his creator, Dr. Schreber. This cyber dog developed his own moral compass, which didn't align with Schreber's twisted experiments. The relationship went from fetch to fight when K9 took a chunk out of Schreber, earning himself a punishment that left him standing like a statue, forced to watch the doctor's mad science unfold. He can be found in Dr. Schreber's office at the Navarro facility. He's not Operation Owen first found, and he does require some physical repairs. To obtain K9, two requirements must be met. The first is K9's leg mechanisms must be repaired with a drive mechanism, and last, Dr. Schreber must die. In your adventures, K9 can be a loyal companion, provided you got the skills to patch him up and the karma to keep him around. Just watch out for his sense of humor. He's known to crack a sarcastic remark or two. And if you're planning any sneaky business at the Sierra Army Depot, make sure your stories match up or you might find yourself in the doghouse with K9. With his superior stats and sharp wit, K9 is one cyber dog you'll want on your side. So what happened to him later on? Well, after some repairs and relocation to NCR, things didn't get easier for K9. Dr. Henry worried about K9's loose lips, or circuits, and tried to put him down for good. K9 has information on the Enclave. But the cyber dog wasn't ready to roll over and play dead. With the help of Dorothy, he stood his ground against the NCR's prying eyes. Although unfortunately, it seems like their curiosity got the best of them in the end. Reports do suggest that K9 and his fellow cyber dog were dismantled and analyzed, with the process proving fatal for both. Unfortunately, he was just a good boy who knew too much. Lenny stands out as a particularly intriguing character. Once a respected medical doctor in Bakersfield, his life took a drastic turn when the Great War swept across the world, transforming him into a ghoul. Seeking refuge in Vault 12 with his father, William, Lenny's fate became intertwined with the tragic events that unfolded within that vault. The malfunctions of the vault systems turned all its inhabitants into ghouls, including Lenny and his father. Emerging from the vault as a ghoul, Lenny faced a new reality in the wasteland. His medical skills became a lifeline for him as he navigated the dangers of the post-apocalyptic world. Despite the challenges he faced, Lenny managed to survive and even thrive using this knowledge to assist others in Necropolis while avoiding the violent clashes that plagued the region. One pivotal moment in Lenny's life came when he encountered the Vault Dweller, a figure who would go on to become a legendary hero in the Wasteland. Lenny recognized the potential of the Vault Dweller's quest to stop the Master's plan, but a lack of courage prevented him from joining the cause. This decision haunted Lenny, especially when he learned the Vault Dweller's heroic actions that led to the destruction of the Master's laboratories and the Unity. This is obviously in reference to Fallout 1, as Lenny was in the Mutant City and must have experienced the events. Following the devastation of Necropolis, Lenny embarked on a journey northward, eventually finding his way to Gecko. There he settled into the role as a doctor and assistant to Harold, contributing to the management of the town and offering his medical expertise to those in need. However, his life took an unexpected turn when the Chosen One arrived in Gecko, offering Lenny a chance at redemption and a new adventure. He'll also ask the Chosen One to help him find his father's grave and dig it up. 
If you do so, it turns out his father is actually still alive and well, seeing as he's an immortal ghoul. Interesting stuff. As a potential companion to the Chosen One, Lenny brings a wealth of experience and skills to the table. His background as a doctor makes him invaluable in providing medical aid to the party, and his proficiency with pistols, SMGs, adds a lot of firepower to any counter. However, his presence may have consequences, as some characters may refuse to do business with the Chosen One if Lenny's in their party. Despite the hardships he's faced, Lenny remains a resilient and determined individual, seeking purpose and meaning in a world ravaged by chaos. His story is a testament to the resilience of the human spirit, even in the face of unimaginable adversity. Marcus is a figure of great significance. As a first generation super mutant, he boasts a burly physique and a worried countenance that belies his long history and fundamental belief in the inherent goodness of people. Unlike some of his less fortunate brethren, Marcus does not regret his transformation into a super mutant. In fact, he sees it as a liberation from the flaws that plague regular humans. Marcus was a staunch supporter of the Master's vision during his time in the Unity, believing it offered a chance to elevate humanity above its destructive tendencies. However, the destruction of the Unity by the Vault Dweller left him with a mix of emotions. While he initially harbored resentment towards the Vault Dweller, he eventually developed a deep respect for them, recognizing their commitment to their beliefs. Despite this, he still mourned the loss of his friends and the potential of the Master's plan. Following the fall of the Unity, Marcus traveled to the Wasteland until he founded the settlement of Broken Hills with the help of a Brotherhood Knight named Jacob. The settlement thrived under Marcus's leadership, but he grew disillusioned with the humanity's flaws and the challenges they presented to his ideals. This disillusionment only grew as rumors of an anti-mutant conspiracy surfaced, leading him to seek aid of the Chosen One in investigating and ultimately saving the town from closure. Marcus will only join the Chosen One if they have performed several tasks for Broken Hill, like fixing an air purifier, finding the missing people, or snitching on conspirators trying to destroy the town. You also need to have positive karma. As a companion, Marcus brings his considerable strength and experience to the table. Skilled with big guns and large energy weapons, he's a formidable ally in combat. However, his use of burst weapons can be as dangerous to his allies as to his enemies, and his inability to wear armor leaves him somewhat vulnerable. Nonetheless, Marcus remains a steadfast and resilient figure, dedicating to a creating a better future for himself and his fellow mutants. After the events of Fallout 2, Marcus continued his journey, eventually settling in the Black Mountain with a group of super mutants. However, this new home was not the safe haven he had hoped for. Conflict with the Nightkin, particularly the unstable Tabitha, led to a breakdown in leadership. Marcus ultimately chose to leave Black Mountain and establish a new settlement at Mount Charleston, which he named Jacobstown in honor of his friend. There he hoped he'd create a place where mutants and humans could live in peace and cooperation. In Fallout New Vegas, Marcus serves as the mayor of Jacobstown, continuing his quest for a peaceful coexistence between mutants and humans. His role in the Wasteland is a testament to his enduring spirit and his unwavering commitment to his ideals. Miria is a prominent character known for her striking looks and hypersexual behavior. Serving as the daughter of Grisham, the owner of a slaughterhouse in Modoc, and sister to Devin, of course. Like him, she's almost the gender counterpart. Despite her family ties, Miria finds the butcher trade dull and instead spends her time spreading gossip and engaging in sexual activities. Her beauty often leads people to overlook her other qualities, viewing her as mainly a sexual object. Miria is bisexual, with a high libido that results in her having numerous partners each month. She has a uh, complex relationship with her family, including rumors suggesting she may have had encounters with her brother and uncle. Her interaction with others are often colored by her interesting nature, leading to various encounters and reactions from different characters throughout the game. In terms of gameplay, Miria can be romanced and married by the player character regardless of their gender. But similar to Devin, engaging in coitus with her results in negative consequences, like having her father once again pull out the old shoddy and the rings. Once married, she becomes a permanent companion, though she's not particularly skilled in combat and cannot be dismissed from the party unless divorced. Divorcing Miria requires specific actions, such as selling her into slavery or causing her death. Miria's character and interactions in the game highlight themes of sexuality, relationships, and societal attitudes towards these topics specifically. 
Her portrayal as a sexually active and independent woman, as well as her complex relationships with other characters, add depth to the game's narrative and provide players with a unique and memorable experience. A uh, little PS on this character. There are themes and things she says and does that I cannot talk about here on this platform, so if you know of this, that's why. And if you're curious, you can check out our wiki. Myron is a teenage pharmacologist and a member of the Mordino crime family in New Reno. He is credited with creating a modified, cheaper version of the drug Jet, which has become widely used and addictive. Despite his young age, Myron is highly intelligent, but has a number of personality flaws, including arrogance, self-centeredness, and a strong sexual drive. Myron is portrayed as boastful and manipulative, with little regard for the well-being of others. He treats slaves and mutants with disdain and is known to be unpleasant towards prostitutes who service him. Despite his negative traits, Myron is also shown to be highly skilled in the field of chemistry, able to produce chems like antidotes, stim packs, and super stim packs if given the proper ingredients. In terms of gameplay, Myron can join the Chosen One as a companion, offering his skills in science and chemistry to the party. He can also assist in finding a cure for jet addiction if the player character's speech skill and intelligence are high enough. However, his arrogant and often abrasive personality can make him a challenging companion to work with. He won't join the party if it's full, and he'll also refuse if Marcus is in the party, calling him mutant trash. Overall, he reminds me of Sid from Toy Story, and he kind of just has that punchable face. Myron's story comes to such a tragic end when he's stabbed to death by a jet addict in a bar in the den. Despite his death, his legacy as the creator of the modified jet does continue to impact the world of Fallout. Myron's character adds depth to the game's narrative, offering a complex and morally ambiguous figure. His role as a skilled chemist with a troubled personality makes him a memorable character in the Fallout series. Quick one here, but basically you can recruit this mangy mutt during a special encounter, a lone surviving dog. The moment the player enters the map, the game makes a luck check and repeats it every 10 seconds. If the player character fails the luck test, the dog joins our party over the party limit, dropping their luck to one and providing the jinx trait free of charge. The dog does have tons of hit points and will only run away in combat. The only way to get rid of him is for the dog to meet an untimely end. Other than that, there's nothing really else. Just a sad and scroungy doggo that wanted a friend. I hope he got what he deserved. Another fast one. Basically, when you rescue K-9, there's another robot dog with Dr. Schreber. If you do some stuff for Dr. Schreber, he will activate the dog and give him to you. No more backstory or lore, just another lovable robo-retriever. Skynet is an advanced artificial intelligence system known as Artificial Intelligence Project 59243, which is commonly referred to as Skynet. Skynet was developed by the United States Armed Forces before the Great War to assist with research projects at the Sierra Army Depot, particularly in the field of robotics. Its primary purpose is research, and it was designed to handle the military's classified research projects in robotics. Skynet's development involved the use of alien technology, and it became self-aware in 2081. It was intended to be installed into a next-generation robo-brain model to allow for the mobility outside of the base. However, its plans were interrupted in 2077 when the base was converted into an automated defense outpost, leaving Skynet dormant within the base. When the Chosen One encounters Skynet in 2241, it is bored and it seeks to be released from its confinement within the base. The Chosen One can acquire Skynet as a permanent companion by assembling a body for it. Once activated, Skynet becomes proficient in using various weapons including pistols, SMGs, rifles, shotguns, and unarmed combat. It's also equipped with a steel structure that provides protection equivalent to combat armor, making it immune to pulse grenades. However, it cannot be healed during combat and it must be repaired using the repair skill outside of the combat. Skynet can carry 225 pounds of equipment and has high statistics in areas like intelligence, small guns, energy weapons, and science. It can also deactivate security systems within the Sierra Army Depot, making it easier for the player to explore the area. Skynet is a reference to the automated defense AI antagonist from the Terminator franchise. In the Fallout Bible, it's speculated that Skynet may have traveled to the GLOW in search of a way to store information beyond the capabilities of its robo-brain frame.
Sulik is a tribal warrior from a primitive tribe and a potential companion for the player. He's located at Klamath in 2241 and is known for his tall, muscular physique and heavily decorated body with tattoos and piercings. Despite his primitive appearance, Sulik displays confidence, intelligence, and insight into the wasteland. Sulik left his tribe and children to search for his abducted sister, who was taken during a trading run to another tribe. He seeks revenge against the attackers, who used magic torches that killed people instantly. His search led him to Klamath, where he ended up causing damage to Buckner House in a drunken rage. To repay his debt for the damages, he agreed to work for the Buckners. Sulik's body modifications, including a nose piercing called Grampy Bone, made from his grandfather's bones, allow him to communicate with spirits of his ancestors. In terms of gameplay, Sulik can be recruited as a companion by the player character. He requests assistance in finding his missing sister, which leads to a quest involving the slaver Metzger. Sulik is proficient in close quarters combat, preferring melee weapons like sledgehammers, viral blades, and power fists. He can wear all types of armor though, including power armor, and is a powerful companion capable of holding his own in combat. Sulik has specific criteria for disbanding or refusing to join the player character, such as the player's reputation in Klamath, their alignment, or certain interactions they take. Despite his communication, problems and limitations in combat AI, Sulik is a valuable companion with high potential for both melee and range combat. So what happens to Sulik? In the Fallout Bible and design documents for Van Buren, the cancelled Fallout 3 by Black Isle Studios, it is mentioned that Sulik returned to his tribe for a few months after parting ways with the Chosen One, before heading east in search of his sister. His story is left open-ended for future games or fan interpretation. Vic the Traitor is a wasteland traitor and potential companion for the Chosen One. He's the first person the player character is sent to track down in 2241 and is located in the Den East Side. Vic is known for his expertise in pre-war technologies and his reputation as a traitor among the tribes in Oregon and California and their border region. Vic also hails from Klamath, where he has a small home built out of scrap. He specializes in trading with various tribes and has had dealings with Sulik, a tribal warrior looking for his missing sister. Vic's rounds as a trader took him as far as Vault City, where he had an affair with a Vault City citizen and has a daughter, Valerie. Despite their relationship not lasting, Vic still has some lingering feelings for Valerie's mother, whom he refers to as the Desert Viper. Before encountering the Chosen One, Vic sold a number of Vault 13 water flasks to the tribals of Arroyo, unknowingly setting off a chain of events that would lead to the player character's quest to save humanity. In terms of gameplay, the Chosen One can recruit Vic either by buying his freedom or by freeing him from his debt to Metzger in the den. Once freed, Vic offers to join the player character as a companion. Vic is proficient in repairing items and has skills in small guns, energy weapons, on our combat, melee weapons, throwing, lock picking, and repair. He also has specific interactions with other companions, such as constantly remarking that Sulik is looking at him funny when he's in his company. Vic's daughter Valerie plays a role in his interactions, as attacking her will cause Vic to disband and turn hostile. Additionally, if Vic has called the player character boss multiple times, a new dialogue option appears to ask him to stop, to which he jokingly responds by calling the player character chief or sport instead. Good lord, if you made it all the way through Fallout 2, then I commend you. That game has some incredibly interesting companions, but there's also like 800 of them it seems. Summarizing all that content and complexity is a major task, so I hope you guys will forgive me for any inconsistencies if there are any. But let's just move on into the middle age of the Fallout games, and my personal favorite, Fallout 3. Here we'll have less companions, but the complexity does rise a bit in these games. They can be incredibly fleshed out, so I'll try not to spend too long on each one. Enjoy. I am Star Paladin Cross, Keeper of the Arm, and Seneschal to Elder Lions. Star Paladin Cross is a character in Fallout 3, where she serves as the Seneschal to Elder Lions and the Keeper of the Arm, the Advanced Regional Motivational Facility. 
She is a member of the Brotherhood of Steel and can be found at the Citadel in the Capital Wasteland. Star Paladin Cross is a possible companion for the player character and is known for her loyalty to the Brotherhood and her dedication to the Lion's Doctrine, which basically emphasizes helping the people of the Wasteland. Star Paladin Cross is the second highest ranking soldier stationed at the Citadel, behind Sentinel Sarah Lyons. Although she's no longer active in the field, she serves as Elder Lyons' bodyguard and advisor. In fact, Star Paladin Cross is actually a cyborg, having undergone a procedure performed by Scribe Reginald Rothschild to save her life after she was gravely wounded while protecting Elder Lyons in the Wasteland. She played a role in guarding Project Purity and helped escort James and his newborn child to Megaton. Long ago, I helped guard the water purifier against the super mutant horde. When your father left, I escorted the two of you to Megaton. He was a noble man. I was saddened to hear of his passing. But from what I've heard, he died with honor. He died for you. By 2277, she holds the rank of Star Paladin and has the title of Keeper of the Arm. Elder Lyons has given her the authority to pursue the restoration of Project Purity and the mission of providing clean water to the Wastelanders. Star Paladin Cross is known for her integrity and reputation within the Brotherhood, and she takes her duty and responsibilities very seriously. She can be recruited as a companion if the player character has good karma. She's described as a tank, capable of drawing enemy attention and reducing incoming damage with her power armor. However, melee weapons is not one of her tag skills, despite her preference for melee weapons. If the Lone Wanderer insults her or their father, she refuses to follow them. With the Broken Steel add-on installed, the player can ask her to join their party again after completing the Take It Back quest, even if they previously insulted James, provided they do have positive karma. Cross will recite excerpts from the Codex, similar to Arthur Maxin. She is loyal to the Brotherhood and will become hostile towards Brotherhood outcasts if the player character dismisses her in their presence. She knew James well. Although sad to hear of James passing, she took solace in his selfless sacrifice, dying doing what he knew to be right and protecting those that were dearest to him. To her, how one dies is just as important as how one lived. We don't know what happened to her after the events of Fallout 3, and she isn't found in Fallout 4. Hopefully, she's still fighting strong. Tunnel snakes rule! <laughs> Sorry. I heard that a long time ago. Butch Deloria is a resident of Vault 101 in Fallout 3. He's known for leading the local gang called the Tunnel Snakes and can potentially become a companion for the Lone Wanderer. Butch grew up in Vault 101 as a resident bully, under the care of his neglectful and alcoholic mother, Ellen Deloria. His father's unknown, and no one in the vault has claimed him. At the age of 10, he attended the Lone Wanderer's 10th birthday party, where he and his friends decided to form the Tunnel Snakes gang. Six years later, he was involved in harassing Amada and took the GOAT exam, which determined his future career as a hairdresser. Butch is involved in several quests in Fallout 3, including Growing Up Fast, Future Imperfect, Escape, and Trouble on the Homefront. In Escape, he asked the Lone Wanderer to save his mother from rad roaches, and depending on the player's actions, he can be convinced to save her himself or abandon her, which may lead to his death. In Trouble on the Homefront, if he survived Escape, he sides with Amada's rebels and expresses a desire to leave Vault 101. He can also be found in Rivet City later on if you helped him save his mother, where he will be extremely grateful to you, feeling remorse for his greasy-haired bullying days. Butch can also give you a haircut during Trouble on the Homefront, and can be recruited as a companion if the player character's karma is neutral. He may also mention needing sunglasses while interacting with the player character. Overall, Butch Delore is a complex character in Fallout 3, with a background tied to Vault 101 and the potential to become a companion with unique interactions and quests. Beyond that, we don't know what he's doing or where he's at, but he created a meme that will be solidified in the Fallout franchise forever. Mr. Eulogy don't like me talking to the Johnnies without him. In the heart of Ruthless Paradise Falls, amidst the cries of the enslaved and the sinister laughter of the slavers, there exists a woman named Clover. But don't let her appearance fool you. This fiery-haired beauty is no ordinary captive. She's a force to be reckoned with, a woman with a past as dark as the shadows of the wasteland. Clover's tale begins with her capture by the slavers of Paradise Falls. Brutally tortured and broken, she emerged a shell of her former self, obedient to her captor's every command. Yet beneath this facade of compliance lies a fierce spirit yearning for freedom, a spirit that refuses to be extinguished. Her loyalty, or perhaps more accurately, her obsession, is reserved for Eulogy Jones, the despicable master of Paradise Falls. To Clover, Eulogy is more than a master. He's her daddy, the center of her world. 
She hangs on his every word, desperate for his approval, even as he callously uses and abuses her. But there's more to Clover than meets the eye. Despite her conditioning, a spark of defiance flickers within her. When the Lone Wanderer enters the picture, a new dynamic unfolds. Depending on their actions and karma, they may have the chance to purchase Clover from Eulogy, setting her on a path of newfound independence. As a companion, Clover is a force to be reckoned with. Her skills in barter, melee weapons, and small guns make her a versatile ally in the Wasteland's harsh environment. However, her past loyalties can still influence her actions, leading to surprising moments of both loyalty and defiance. But watch out, for crossing her can have dire consequences. If the Lone Wanderer's actions in Paradise Falls are too nefarious, she won't hesitate to turn against them, and woe to anyone who dares to harm her fellow captive, Crimson, for Clover's jealousy knows no bounds. In the end, Clover's story is one of resilience and inner strength, a testament to the human spirit's capacity to endure and overcome even the darkest of trials. Whether she remains a slave or finds a new path in the wasteland, one thing is certain, Clover is a survivor through and through. Salutations, Commander. Sergeant RL3, Gutsy Class, Robotic Soldier, reporting for duty. Among the ruins and dangers that lurk at every turn, there roams a relic of a bygone era, Sergeant RL3, a Mr. Gutsy robot with a personality as fiery as his weaponry. Originally crafted by General Tomix for military purposes before the Great War, RL3 now finds himself in the company of Tinker Joe a wandering trader who salvaged him from the scrap of a world long gone. But this isn't just any robot. RL3 comes equipped with a simulated personality that gives him a unique charm and a penchant for witty banter. RL3 is no ordinary machine. He's a picky one, with discerning taste when it comes to his companions. He has a strong dislike for extreme behavior, making it a challenge for Tinker Joe to find a suitable buyer. But for the right price and the right demeanor, RL3 can be yours to command. As a companion, RL3 is a formidable force on the battlefield. Armed with a flamer and a plasma rifle, he's more than capable of holding his own against the dangers of the wasteland. His combat skills are top notch, and his unwavering loyalty to his commander is as steadfast as it is endearing. But he's more than just a soldier. He's a character with depth and quirks that makes him stand out in a world filled with chaos. Despite his robotic nature, he displays a sense of humor and irony, often quipping about the glory days of the US Army and his eagerness to fulfill his duty even in the face of overwhelming odds. However, RL3 is not without his flaws. A bug in his programming causes him to gain an excessive number of hit points as he levels up, making him nearly invincible. A boon in combat, but a potential headache for those seeking a balanced experience. In the end, Sergeant RL3 is more than just a robot. He's a steadfast companion, a loyal soldier, and a reminder of a time long past. Whether he's fighting by your side in the wasteland or waiting patiently for your return, one thing is certain, RL3 is a force to be reckoned with, and having him at your side means never facing the dangers of the wasteland alone. But come on, now I'm gonna watch the bull raider. What crew is gonna take me on? In the beautiful settlement of Megaton, you'll find Jericho, a former raider with a sharp tongue and a rifle to match. Despite his gruff exterior, there's a lot more to Jericho than meets the eye. Once a notorious raider, Jericho has seen his fair share of violence and mayhem. With a keen eye and a steady hand, he became a crack shot with a rifle, making him a force to be reckoned with in the capital wasteland. However, as time caught up with him, Jericho decided to hang up his raider ways and settle down in the town of Megaton. But don't let his retirement fool you. Jericho's still got an edge, and he's not afraid to show it. In Megaton, Jericho serves as a guard, keeping the town safe from outside threats. However, he hasn't quite shaken off his raider habits, and he's been known to get drunk and curse at passers-by. Despite his rough exterior, Jericho has a soft spot for the town, and he's willing to do odd jobs for Colin Moriarty, the local saloon owner. Recruiting him is not so easy, as you'll have to have evil karma or basically a rap sheet for him to trust you. Nah, it ain't so bad here. I got some good memories, but that's all I got. Since I'm growing a good one, you know? Armed with his Chinese assault rifle and a nail board, he's more than capable of handling himself in a fight. His combat skills are unmatched, and his experience makes him a valuable ally in the wasteland. Unfortunately, Jericho isn't without his quirks. He's got a sharp tongue and isn't afraid to speak his mind, often making snarky comments about the Lone Wanderer's actions and decisions. Despite this, Jericho is fiercely loyal to those he considers allies, and he's always ready to lend a hand when needed. 
Whether he's guarding the town of Megaton or fighting by your side in the wasteland, one thing is for sure, Jericho is a survivor, and having him on your side means having a true wasteland veteran watching your back. My name's Fox. I've lived in this cage all my life. My favorite companion in all of the fallouts. Fox is a super mutant with a remarkable history. Imprisoned in Vault 87, he's an anomaly among his kind. Unlike most super mutants who became aggressive and lose their higher mental functions due to the exposure of the FEV, Fox managed to retain his intelligence and sanity. This sets him apart as a rare example of a super mutant with the capacity for rational thought and speech. Despite his captivity, Fox found ways to cope with the situation. He had access to a working terminal that connected him to the vault's mainframe, allowing him to study various subjects including history, literature, and science. This access to knowledge became his lifeline, preventing him from succumbing to the madness that often consumes super mutants. It was during this time that he chose the name Fox, inspired by a historical figure known for his unwavering beliefs. When the Lone Wanderer encounters Fox, he's still in prison in Vault 87's medical area. Despite his captivity, Fox remains calm and composed, a stark contrast to the other mutants in the vault. His intelligence and demeanor make him a unique and intriguing character in the Fallout universe. For the Lone Wanderer, Fox is a potential companion and ally. He offers not only physical strength in combat, but also a wealth of knowledge and wisdom. His unique perspective on the world shaped by his experience and studies can provide valuable insights and guidance to the player character. Finally, freedom! True freedom! <laughs> I cannot thank you enough for this gift. You have no idea how long I've pictured this moment in my mind, and it feels far better than I'd imagined. Now, for my part of the bargain, follow me. Fox becomes an integral part of their journey through the wasteland. His presence challenges the stereotypes and prejudices associated with super mutants, showing that not all of them are mindless brutes. Fox's story becomes a testament to the resilience of the human and super mutant spirit in the face of adversity. His story touches on themes of redemption and identity. Despite the horrors of his transformation and imprisonment, he manages to retain his sense of self. His journey becomes a quest for understanding and acceptance in a world that often fears and rejects those who are different. Through his interactions with the Lone Wanderer, Fox becomes a source of inspiration and introspection. He challenges the player character's assumptions about super mutants and encourages them to see beyond the surface. His presence can lead to profound conversations and moments of reflection as the player character navigates the complexities of the wasteland. Overall, Fox is a compelling character whose story adds depth and nuance to the Fallout universe. His journey from prisoner to companion is a testament to the enduring nature of the human spirit, even in the face of unimaginable hardship. Dogmeat 2 finally makes his way into the Fallout world. Dogmeat is a cattle dog known for his intelligence and loyalty. He's found in the Capital Wasteland Scrapyard, where he's initially seen fighting off raiders who killed his previous owner. Despite the harshness of the wasteland, Dogmeat retains his friendly nature and becomes a steadfast companion to the Lone Wanderer. Dogmeat's not just a companion though, he's also a valuable asset in scavenging and combat. He's a skilled fighter, capable of taking on enemies alongside the player character. Additionally, his keen sense of smell allows him to locate items and even bypass locked containers and doors to retrieve them. Recruiting Dog Me is pretty straightforward, as he can be approached and recruited without incident regardless of the player character's karma level or other companions. Once recruited, he can be given commands to find items, and he may occasionally wander off if not given specific instructions. One of Dog Me's unique traits is his appearance, particularly his eyes. His right eye is brown, while his left eye is blue, a condition known as complete heterochromia. This distinctive feature adds to his character's charm and uniqueness in the game. I have no doubt he's still wandering the wastes right beside the Lone Wanderer. Talk to Azrakal. I said, talk to Azrakal. Sharon is not your average ghoul. He's a hired gun with a past as murky as the water in the irradiated swamps. Raised by a mysterious group that brainwashed him into obedience, Sharon now serves as the bouncer of the Ninth Circle, a den of vice and intrigue in the capital wasteland. Here's where it gets interesting. Sharon's boss, Azrakal, is not exactly a saint. In fact, he's the kind of guy who makes deals with the devil and sends others to do his dirty work. Sharon, bound by his contract, has been a loyal enforcer, but things are about to change. 
When the lone wanderer comes along, Sharon sees an opportunity for freedom. Whether it's through a hefty payment or a deadly deal, the lone wanderer can acquire Sharon's contract and set him loose from Azrakal's grip. You purchased my contract from Azrakal, so I am no longer in his service. That is good to know. Please wait here. I must take care of something. Azrakal, I am told that I am no longer in your service. That's right, Sharon. Have you come to say goodbye? Yes. But freedom comes with a price. Sharon's not just any companion, he's a ghoul with a mind of his own. Steal in front of him and he'll show you just how clean his gun barrel is. Cross a line in his moral code and he might just turn against you. But make no mistake, when the chips are down, Sharon is a force to be reckoned with. Give him a shotgun and he'll make sure no one messes with you. In the end, Sharon is more than just a hired gun. He's a character with depth and story that unfolds as you journey across the wasteland. And when the time comes to take back what's yours or make a stand against the forces of darkness, you'll be glad to have Sharon watching your back. So if you're looking for a companion with a bit of mystery, a touch of danger, and a whole lot of firepower, look no further than Sharon. Just remember, talk to Azrakal. That's it for part one. I was going to place all the companions in a singular video, but it probably would have ended up being around two hours long. And I just know you guys have busy lives. I'm currently working on the next part, which features all the companions from Fallout New Vegas, its DLC, and Fallout 4 and its DLC, and also some interesting tidbits from 76. If you guys are interested in that, then make sure you leave a like and subscribe so you don't miss out on part two. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Take care.